All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. We do have a smaller crowd this morning. Maybe some folks will be uh, coming in a little bit late. Maybe some folks are traveling. Um, but that's okay. Glad that you all are here. Uh, let's begin with a, a word of prayer. Um, Chastity texted me this morning with a couple of prayer requests she wanted to make sure uh, were mentioned. These are family members and friends of hers who are dealing with some recent losses. Um, she wanted me to lift up in prayer the Cox family. This is her, so it's her sister's in-laws, her sister's father-in-law passed away. Uh, so let's pray for the Cox family. And then she also wanted me to pray for the Durbin family, uh, D-U-R-B-I-N, Durbin family, um, <clears throat> the head doctor at the practice where she works. Is that right, Chris? Yes. Um, his father passed away. So uh, she wanted me to lift up that family as well. So I've, I've got those two names on a prayer list, Cox family and Durbin family. Um, are there any others that we want to be praying for this morning? Charles? Yes. Yes, we'll, we'll be praying. Uh, very sorry to, to hear, hear of the loss, Charles. We'll be praying for them. Anyone else? Great. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Kelsey told me the news yesterday after the ladies' devotional. Sue had mentioned in prayer that she was getting a test run on esophagus, is that right? Yeah. Uh, for potential cancer, and it came back negative. So that's something to give thanks for. Um, and with, with Jen, is it still kidney stones or other things? Yeah, she still has them, but I don't think she gets had no pain yesterday. First day in a long time. Okay. Well, that's good. We'll take whatever yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, that's something to be thankful for. Um, I'd like us to pray for Kelsey's friend, uh, Michelle, who you all, several of you know. Uh, she had hip replacement surgery last week, and uh, the surgery went well. But the other day, she went to the ER, I think just because of the pain. I, don't, I didn't actually, I don't think Kelsey got details or didn't pass them on to me. But I'd like us to continue to, continue to pray for uh, Michelle. All right, well, if that's our prayer requests, then go with me in prayer. And then uh, we'll get class started this morning. Father God, thank you for bringing us here this morning uh, to, to see a new day and to see a new first day of the week where we can gather together with family, with family in Christ, and uh, see one another and catch up with one another, talk and laugh together, and thank you that we can open up your word. We ask that you bless our time in your word, and we ask that you bless our time in worship as well. Uh, Father, we know that you shower so many blessings on us every day, and sometimes when we list prayer requests of different needs, we can, we can forget uh, to also include prayers of thanksgiving, and, and we thank you for all the ways that you fill our lives with rich, good things, uh, things that we often take for granted and, and don't even realize the ways that they benefit us, different relationships, different opportunities, different experiences, uh, different ways that you meet our needs. We thank you for all those blessings. Father, we want to lift up the people we've mentioned this morning on our prayer list, the various people who need you. Uh, we lift up the Cox family right now and their loss. Um, with uh, Chastity's sister's uh, father-in-law passing away and everyone who will be missing him. We also want to pray for the Durbin family, uh, the doctor where Chastity works with his father passing away, that you'll bless him, bless his family in this loss. And Father, we lift up our brother Charles. We uh, love him. We, we pray that you'll bless him and Fran, and we pray that you'll bless his family in the loss of his brother, that you will surround and comfort them, walk with them through this time. Um, we thank you so much. Uh, for Charles and for the, the things he does for our church. And right now we, we lift up uh, him and his family. Father, we also want to pray for uh, Sue. We give you thanks that she had the negative uh, results, and we are so grateful for that. We ask that you continue to bless her health, uh, but we thank you for those negative results. And Lord, we also want to say a prayer of thanksgiving for Jen. We thank you that 
she's had a pain-free day yesterday, which has been rare lately. We ask that you continue to bless her with these kidney stones and that you'll watch over her health. And Father, last of all, we uh, want to lift up Kelsey's friend, Michelle. Uh, we thank you that her surgery went well, but we pray that you'll continue to bless her in dealing with the pain. And uh, we ask that you will <clears throat> guide her in this recovery process. Father, we, again, thank you for all of our blessings. We know there are other prayer requests we could have made that uh, may be on our hearts or different things happening around the world that uh, are way bigger than us, and we may not even fully understand them, but we ask your blessings on those types of situations as well. And we pray that you will use your kingdom across the world and that you will use us as individual members of your kingdom uh, to do good, to represent Christ, to spread the good news uh, in this world, and that you'll be glorified in that. It's in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, let me see, get the clicker. Um, <clears throat> let me pull my notes up. If you'd like, in your own Bibles, you can be turning to Romans chapter 14. Uh, but of course, as always, the passages will be on the screen. Um, we are now, uh, after this lengthy study of Romans, we're now in the last major teaching of Romans. Uh, the, the last major teaching of Romans is a lengthy teaching. Uh, so we were in it last week. We're in it this week as well. Uh, it, it, this last teaching stretches from the beginning of chapter 14 through about the first half of chapter 15. And last week, uh, we covered the first 12 verses of Romans 14. So in this passage, uh, we've been reading about Paul addressing a specific issue that uh, the Christians in Rome are being confronted with. And, and Christians in Rome, basically what the issue is, they're dividing over some things. Christians in Rome are, are experiencing some division. Uh, and Paul, the way he describes this division uh, he describes it as a division between the weak on one hand and the strong on the other hand. The weak and the strong. That's the nature of the division. That's the way he, he uh, refers to the two camps in this division. And from what we were reading last week, when he talks about the weak, uh, he says they are weak in faith. And uh, from what we were reading as he describes what's going on there, we saw that they're not weak in faith in the sense that they're barely holding on to faith in God or barely holding on to faith in Jesus. That's not what Paul means. Um, it seems like, based on what he says, he's referring to Christians uh, who may have some strong convictions, but uh, their faith could benefit from some deeper appreciation, uh, some deeper understanding of the implications of the gospel for their lives and for uh, the way that they live. And so... Um, the weak have put some of the specific things that, that are going on. The weak have put some restrictions on themselves uh, regarding diet. And they are also honoring some days uh, of the year, some days of the week, uh, perhaps even, as especially devoted to God. And so this sounds like, and, and probably not this week, but next week we'll see it more explicit. But this sounds like Jewish Christians... Uh, who are continuing to keep the dietary restrictions from the law of Moses and also continuing to uh, probably honor the Sabbath and maybe honor other religious festival days on the Jewish religious uh, calendar. So the weak seem to be doing these things, while the strong, uh, they feel no need to do these kinds of things. Um, they, they recognize that they do not have to keep those dietary laws. They recognize they do not have to, to honor those special days in the Jewish calendar. Uh, they realize that following Jesus does not require them to do these things. So we read last time how um, the weak, they are passing judgment on the strong uh, for not doing the things that they are doing. And the strong um, are apparently looking down on the weak for um, not being strong enough, not embracing the freedoms that they, um, that they have. And so Paul's instructions as he addresses this division uh, has so far been very balanced towards both groups. Uh, he is not treating this, these types of issues like one position is thoroughly biblical and the other position is thoroughly unbiblical. He's not treating this issue like some foundational aspect of the Christian faith is at risk. Uh, he, he realizes this is not what's going on. Uh, he realizes that followers of Jesus can make different choices regarding these types of things while still being faithful uh, to God. And so Paul's basic uh, instruction, his basic teaching from what we were reading last week, 
uh, has been to tell both groups to remember that God is the one who will be their judge. He's been telling both groups to remember that, which means that they don't need to be judging one another on these kinds of things. Uh, both groups are doing what they're doing or not doing what they're not doing. Both groups are, are acting the way they're acting um, as expressions of their faith in God. And God will honor both groups for that. Uh, and so Paul is saying that should be enough for you all. That should be enough for the weak and the strong to continue to have fellowship with one another uh, despite their disagreements. And so that's pretty much where we left off uh, last time. And so as we get into the next part of this passage, uh, Paul is going to, to transition here from talking in this balanced way. So far he's been addressing weak and strong pretty evenly. He's going to transition from that balanced way of addressing this to addressing those in the strong camp more directly. Uh, he spends most of this teaching, actually, addressing the strong camp um, in, in, among the Roman Christians. Uh, I mentioned last time, based on what Paul has already said from what we let, read last week and what we'll read this week as well, uh, that if Paul had been a Christian living in Rome, uh, Paul himself would have belonged to the strong camp. Um, and most of this teaching that we're going to read, most of this passage, sounds like someone from the strong camp addressing others within the strong camp and telling them um, to make sure that their attitudes and their actions are in line with the gospel. That, that's basically the way the rest of this passage reads. Uh, and so based on what Paul says, it sounds as though uh, the strong have had a tendency to abuse their strength, abuse their freedom in Christ in a way that has created some problems uh, among the Christians there. And so Paul is hoping to correct that and what he says. So with all that kind of setting the stage, let's read the next phase of, of Paul's teaching. I'd like us to read verses 13 through 19. Uh, Barbara, you're typically our first volunteer. Could I call on you to read? Thank you. There we go. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Okay, thank you. Um, so Paul begins here in verse 13 um, by saying that instead of passing judgment on one another for not seeing these kinds of issues all the same way, instead of doing that, Christians should decide not to put a stumbling block, not to put a hindrance in the way of their fellow Christians. And Paul will clarify here uh, in, in the next few verses what he means by that. Um, and Paul, again, in verse 14, makes it pretty clear that he is in the strong camp on, this, on these issues. Um, he reveals his own perspective on some of the things that are dividing the Christians in Rome. Uh, and he, he focuses specifically on the dietary uh, issues for, throughout the rest of this uh, passage. And Paul says he is fully confident uh, that nothing a person eats is inherently unclean anymore because of Christ. That's Paul's position on these kinds of things. This is, uh, I mentioned this last week some, but this is really um, remarkable that Paul says this. It shows what a massive difference Christ has made in his life because Paul, uh, before coming to Christ, before encountering Christ, was a Pharisee. And Pharisees took uh, things like the dietary uh, regulations in the law of Moses. Uh, they took those types of things very, very seriously. Uh, so before Christ, there were foods that were inherently uh, unclean for the people of God to eat, but uh, not anymore, and Paul realizes that. Um, but Paul also recognizes, while, while he fully acknowledges that, he also recognizes that just because... Um, all foods are clean now, just because there's no inherently unclean food, uh, that does not mean 
that anyone and everyone should just eat anything and everything. Um, he also recognizes that. He says something is unclean for someone who thinks it is unclean. So Paul has shifted because of Christ. He has shifted where he is not thinking just in terms anymore of inherently clean and inherently unclean foods. He realizes those categories don't really exist uh, in God's eyes. Uh, he's thinking about the conscience of the person who chooses to eat something or chooses not to eat something. The conscience is now what determines uh, what foods are clean or unclean. Um, and Paul says that um, the strong camp needs to be strong enough to walk in love. This is the way they need to exercise their strength. Uh, they, they do not need to be strong enough to flaunt their freedoms in a way that furthers division. And that's the way uh, a lot of, well, a lot of people in cultures all through time have, have uh, perceived of strength. You know, you can, you can kind of flex your muscles and so, show what you've got. Uh, but Paul says that they, they need to be strong enough to walk in love. So he's calling for a different kind of, of strength here. Uh, and he says that if a brother is grieved by what we eat, then we are no longer walking in love. So Paul is calling for the strong to be strong, maybe in a different kind of way. Uh, now, at first glance, if we, if we just had, like, verse 15, uh, apart from the context, which fortunately we don't, we, we stress a lot, you know, trying to set things in context, but if we just had the first part of verse 15, um, this can sound like anything we do that upsets someone else is unloving. That could be a, a, a valid way, if we only had that highlighted sentence on the screen, uh, that could be a valid way to interpret this. And if we interpret it that way, and then if we were really diligent to live out that interpretation, uh, the reality is there's probably almost nothing that uh, we can do that wouldn't upset somebody somewhere. Uh, if, if we think about it, almost everything we do probably upsets someone somewhere out there on planet Earth. But Paul clarifies uh, what he means by grieving a brother or a sister in the second part of verse 15. He says, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died by what you eat. That's the issue. Uh, Paul is not saying that we should only do things that, that everyone would agree uh, is okay. He's saying that we should not do things that would destroy the one Christ died for. And so this connects back to verse 13 where he says we should never put a stumbling block or a hindrance uh, in the way of a brother. So here's the key. Let's not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So I'd like to just put this out there to all of us. Uh, what do you think he means here? What does it mean to destroy the one Christ died for? Barbara. I think what he's talking about is the offense may drive that person out of the church. Mm. Or, and, and so it's destroying him spiritually because he no longer uh, has any faith in, in worshiping God uh, because of them, the way the people treated him by the, what he was offended by. Yeah, I think that would definitely be a way to destroy the one Christ died for. Uh, the way the New Testament thinks of Christianity, if a person gets cut off from their fellow Christians, they are spiritually at risk, and so that could certainly destroy the one Christ died for. Anything else? Kelsey, um, if we could, yeah, maybe pass it back to Mary and then back to Kelsey. I think he's, like, when you're talking about conscience, I think... Um, there's obviously a group of people who their conscience is clear when they're eating <clears throat> this food, and there's a group that their conscience is not clear. And if you're trying to, let's say, because if you're, especially when he's talking about uh, strong in faith versus weak in faith, where we've talked about that doesn't mean you, they don't have faith, it just means they're still growing. But if you take somebody who's a, a growing Christian or a baby Christian, and you basically are pushing them to go against their conscience, for them, it's going to be sin. And so yeah. we have to be really careful not to push people to accept what your understanding is. And then their conscience is not going to be clear and they're going to stumble. It's like talking yeah. about, I think, stumbling in their faith, stumbling into sin. And so I think we just have to be so careful because sin is a very serious yeah. problem. And yeah. Jesus died to set us free from that. 
but I think we still have a conscience for a reason. And there, there are people whose consciences are more strict maybe than, yeah. than others. So I think that's another way I'm, I'm kind of looking at this is, is we could make them stumble into sin because yeah. of their conscience and that's dangerous. Yeah, I think we'll see. I think both of you are touching on key things here. And I think we'll see that as we keep on going, Paul does not want Christians to act in such a way that would motivate, that would tempt, really, other Christians to act against their conscience. Um, an important passage that we won't look at this morning uh, just for sake of time, but that is roughly parallel to this in Romans 14, is 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so maybe encourage you on your own time to read 1 Corinthians 8. It's not that long of a chapter. Um, Paul deals with a similar situation there. It's not exactly the same. It is slightly different, but it's a similar situation. And he makes it clear there. He, he talks there also about stumbling blocks, not putting a stumbling block in the way of a brother. And he makes it clear that what he means by that is tempting another Christian uh, to sin by tempting them to, tempting them to act against their conscience. Um, and Paul says here that, remember, Christ died. Christ died for our brothers and sisters. And all throughout the letter of Romans, we've been reading about uh, quite a bit. We've been reading a lot about Christ's death, and uh, we've been reading how he died so that we may live, so that we may live eternally. Uh, and if Christ died so that we may live, uh, then let's not do something that could spiritually kill, uh, spiritually put to death a brother or sister, because Christ wants us to live. That's why he died. Um, and so notice the contrast here between what Christ is doing, what Christ has done, and what apparently some of the strong camp are doing. Um, Christ went so far as death for us. That's the level of sacrifice that he made. Um, and so the Christians, the Roman Christians, they ought to be able uh, to, to be willing to at least go as far as uh, not eating certain foods for their brothers and sisters. That's a much smaller sacrifice in comparison to the sacrifice uh, of Christ. And then in verses 16 through 19, the rest of what Barbara read for us, uh, Paul gives some principles that are behind this teaching, uh, this teaching not to act in a way that would put a stumbling block in the way of a brother or sister. So he begins by saying, do not let uh, what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. And once again, this is another sentence where if we just had the sentence without any context, we might think that Paul is saying that uh, anything that somebody somewhere could consider evil is something that we should not do. Uh, but that would mean, of course, if that were true, that the strong would have absolutely no freedom at all. Uh, no Christian would really have uh, any freedom because almost anything we do, somebody somewhere could probably consider it to be wrong. Um, so in this greater context, I think what Paul is saying is don't uh, let something good be spoken of as evil because in the context they're in, when word gets back to the weaker brother, it could tempt them uh, to sin. And Paul gets really, in verse 17, right to the heart of the matter. Uh, he reminds the Roman Christians in verse 17 what the kingdom of God is all about. Um, and it's not about the freedoms that we have in Christ. And in this context, it's not about eating and drinking. Uh, as great as those freedoms that we have are, and as much as we love them and celebrate them, it's not actually about those things. Um, it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And Paul does not want the Roman Christians to act in such a way that they disrupt these things. They disrupt righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit uh, and keep those things from being a part of the kingdom because that's what the kingdom uh, is all about. And so this is a, a good reminder, this principle that Paul lays down in verse 17. Uh, it's a good reminder that things like righteousness, peace, joy in the, in the spirit, these are not just things that Christians are meant to experience individually. They are, but they're not only that. Uh, if they were only things that we're meant to enjoy privately as part of our private walk with God, then the strong Roman Christians could just keep on doing what they're doing uh, and not worry about uh, how it's affecting other Christians. But righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit, these things are supposed to be experienced communally among the people of God in the church. Uh, and, and that's what the kingdom of God is all about. So when the Roman Christians um, are, are having their lives oriented towards these things, towards these key things, then what their behavior ought to be in this situation should then become clear to them. 
And this, um, this teaching in verse 17, I think is a good uh, reminder for us, a good challenge for us. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, life is very, very complex, and the New Testament is not a super long book. Uh, there's a lot of situations we may encounter in life where we have to decide what is the best thing to do, what is the most God-honoring thing to do, and we may not have a specific book, chapter, and verse for every single situation uh, that we're in. But when we have our lives oriented towards the kingdom of God, uh, when that's the focus, the direction of our lives, then what we should do in those situations often becomes clearer uh, to us. Jesus taught in a different context something kind of similar to this. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. That's, the, that's how you should orient your life. Orient your life around the kingdom of God, and everything that you need, he says, will be added uh, to you. So God and his kingdom, um, that should be first. That should be like the center of gravity for us in all of our decision making. And when it is, again, what we, we should do in all kinds of various situations in which we find ourselves, uh, what we should do uh, becomes clearer. And, and Paul says that this is how we serve Christ. Following, If we want to serve Christ, we will follow what Paul is saying here. Um, and he mentioned the alternative a few verses ago. The alternative to not serving Christ in this way is destroying the one Christ died for. Uh, but if we don't want to do that, if we remember what the kingdom is all about and let that guide how we interact with others, uh, guide how we interact with our brothers and sisters, then we are really serving Christ. So the strong might think they're serving Christ by just, you know, powering through on expressing their freedoms regardless of how it affects the weak. But Paul says, no, if you want to serve Christ, remember what the kingdom is all about and let that guide how you interact with your weaker brothers and sisters. And it may not be the way that you've been acting. Uh, this is how we truly uh, serve Christ. So Paul says, let's pursue what makes for peace and what makes for uh, building others up. Uh, that's what should motivate a Christian's desire here uh, not to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother, the desire to pursue peace and what makes for mutual um, upbuilding. Okay, so I know I've been kind of talking for a while. This is a fairly good place to pause. Uh, any questions or reflections on anything Paul has said so far? Kelsey. Um, I was just going to say uh, that verse, verse 19, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. It reminds me so much of the fact that I know that there are passages that talk about the individual a member of the church, but this really makes me think of the communal body mm -hmm. and how Paul is trying to say that that is, it is so important to make the body as a whole a priority instead of your individual uh, feelings about things or freedoms. And yeah. we just don't get that. Like I struggle with that yeah. sometimes because it's so easy to just be like, well, my feelings matter and yeah. I'm important because we just tend to hear that in our culture a lot. And so um, th this verse just reminds me that, that Jesus cares so much about us as a group together being in unity more yeah. so than our individual feelings about things. And it's, it's a very humbling thing to have to remember that. And to, to it's like you said, like it's, it's a big sacrifice for, it feels like a big sacrifice for us sometimes to, to tamp down, you know, what we feel or what we want to say sometimes for the good of the whole. But when we remember the great sacrifice he made, it's really not that big of a sacrifice yeah. if we can put it into perspective of what he did for us. And so this is just like really humbling for me to read this because I'm a very outspoken kind of loud mouth person. And so <laughs> just remembering that the the peace of the whole group is so important and yeah. that he's looking at us as a body yeah. together, not just as individual members. Yeah. A um, couple of things on what, what you said there that came to my mind. One is wh what you said I think is always true, but especially think about first century churches. I mean, the Roman church, they're it in Rome. You know, it's so important that that body sticks together. They're the kingdom of God in Rome. If the, if the kingdom of God is going to be represented in Rome, it's going to be from them. So they have to stick together. You know, now, like I grew up in Nashville, and it's so important that any church sticks together. But if a church fell apart in Nashville, well, there's like 15 other churches of Christ, you know. Um, and I'm not saying that's, that, it's sad, that it's not bad if a church falls apart there. It, it is. But so much more in the first century world where 
That little body of Christians meeting together, they're it. They represent Christ. They need to, to, to find a way to work together. And they need to sacrifice for one another to stick together. It's so important. Um, and that applies very well to our own context. You know, we're not a massive church. There's one other Church of Christ in Nicholasville. It's so important that we stick together. Um, so that's one thing that, that came to my mind when you were saying what you were saying. Um, second thing, you, you were talking about how it can be very easy for us to think individualistically. Like, you know, my feelings are, are what are primary here. Um, and I'm not going to make, this is maybe a, Maybe if we're really upset, this is might be how we're thinking. I'm not going to let the, the feelings of everyone else in the church get in the way of, you know, how I'm feeling. Um, this is, thinking this way that Paul describes is always hard. It's always hard to think selflessly. But something I've mentioned before in here multiple times is we live in a much more individualistic culture than Paul's times. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. There's a lot of things about individualism that, individualism that has been good, but it can have its drawbacks. And one is, it can be hard for us to think about the good of the whole body. Uh, we, we might tend to, to privilege our own preferences above the preferences of the body because we do live in a culture that is so saturated with that kind of thinking. Uh, and we need to, uh, with, all, with, with any culture that any Christian is ever in, we have to look at the whole thing in light of scripture and realize, all right, there are some good things our culture emphasizes. There are some things that are downsized, disadvantages, maybe even straight up unbiblical, and we have to we have to adjust, and we have to let the Bible guide how we think and act. And this is one instance of that. Yeah. Sorry, I rambled on a lot about Kelsey's comment, Bob. Yes, I like the idea about walking walking in love, going back to eating meat. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should not eat meat like Paul was saying if it's going to cause my brother to offend. Yeah. But I tell you what, when I'm by myself, I'm going to eat some meat. <laughs> <laughs> but not only that, not only that, Paul is not basically saying it's not about the food. Let's take the food off the table, all right, yeah. and put scripture there. We cannot, we cannot jam the scripture down someone's throat because they are young and babes in Christ. We have to be very careful about that. But the scripture is telling us it's all about love. And I like what James is talking about. James is talking about how, how we should treat people, how we should live. And I think the most important thing about the whole situation is how we treat people. Yeah. That's, that's what Christ is telling. How do we treat them? Yeah. How do we talk to people? Yeah. I appreciate you saying we can't cram scripture down people's throats. Um, when someone maybe comes to Christ and they're a young Christian, there's much to understand. And there's, they're just starting on a journey. And if we just immediately hit them with like, all right, here's everything you need to know. Here's all the changes you need to make. I expect you to make them tomorrow. Uh, that's not going to work very well. And Paul is not advocating that approach. He's saying, bear with these people, even if it means foregoing some things you enjoy doing for a while, and uh, hopefully they will grow. You know, we can work with them. And uh, you said, you know, if you were there, you may not eat meat around them, but in private, you definitely would. I think there's, I, I think some of that at least is in line with what Paul is saying. Uh, Paul elsewhere talks about how when he's with Greeks, he acts like Greeks. When he's with Jews, he acts like Jews. He adjusts his actions based on the context he's in. Um, and, and Paul is basically asking the strong Roman Christians to do the same thing. Uh, adjust for the context you're in, in the way that will best build up the whole, the whole body, the whole kingdom. Yeah. Anybody else on what we've read here? Barbara. Yeah, sorry, they're trying to get the microphone to you. <laughs> As we grow and get stronger and more mature, not only in Christ, but just in our humanity, we can choose not to be offended. And we, can, we learn that, yeah. that, um, that may, something might be offensive, but we don't need to express that. Yeah. But it's an act of maturity. Yeah. And we are in, both in our Christendom and our to our world that we live in. Yeah, we're we have to grow and mature. Yeah, in You're those right. things, and again, not be throwing them down. You know, yeah. in to be a stumbling block <laughs> block to anybody. But yeah, we learn to manage ourselves, and then our world around us will change. You yeah, know, more hopefully, more peaceful. Yeah, peaceable. you're absolutely right. Um, I think Paul ideally would want the, the weak camp to grow to where 
they realize they can eat what they want to eat. And if they don't want to honor the Jewish calendar, they don't have to. But even if they never grow to that point, if they just grow to the point where they can have full fellowship with Strong Camp, that's still a lot of growth. And that would be, I think, kind of in line with the learning that, that you're talking about, that the, the growth where uh, we can be around these types of things without uh, feeling like, our faith is going to collapse, like we're going to fall into sin, or that we have to immediately withdraw from this church, or something like that. Uh, that's a mark of growth. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep on going here. Um, in verses 20 through 23, uh, Paul develops a little more um, about what it means to make a Christian brother or sister stumble. Uh, what he does in verses 20 through 23 is he repeats himself some. And he gives some more instructions to the strong. Again, he's focusing on the strong camp now. And he continues to focus specifically on uh, matters related to food. We mentioned earlier some stuff about food and the calendar. But he only mentions the calendar stuff once. He Mostly this whole teaching is focusing on uh, the food-related matters, the diet matters. So perhaps that's the main thing driving the division in, in the Roman church. Uh, so, let's read this. Uh, would anyone be willing to read verses 20 through 23 for us? Any volunteers? O'Brien, thank you. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God. Blessed, blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For, uh, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. All right. Um, first thing I wanted to mention here is verse 23. I, I think verse 23 uh, clarifies even more what it means to destroy the work of God that we read earlier. Um, Paul talks here about someone who does something, uh, in, in this case specifically someone who eats unclean food, like according to the law of Moses, um, but someone who does something not because their faith approves of what they do, uh, but instead they, they choose to do it in spite of their doubts, in spite of their doubts about whether or not it pleases God. Uh, Paul says that that person who acts from that frame of mind, that person sins. Uh, not because they've done anything inherently wrong, um, but because their conscience uh, did not allow them to do that, and, and they did it anyway. They violated their conscience. Uh, he doesn't use the word conscience here, but that definitely, I think, is the idea behind, uh, behind his words. So Paul says, uh, going back up to verse 20, he says, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food that you realize you have the freedom to eat. And he reaffirms here in verse 20. Uh, he reaffirms that all foods are now clean. Uh, he realizes that in God, it, all foods are clean in God's eyes. But that doesn't automatically mean that a Christian should eat all foods just because all foods are clean. Uh, a Christian should, out of love for their fellow Christians, take their fellow Christians into account. Uh, they need to take their brothers and sisters into account out of love for them. And Paul is saying it is actually wrong to exercise that freedom if it's going to prompt another Christian to fall into sin. And uh, we've mentioned a couple ways that maybe someone could fall into sin. Maybe they could just... The, the food looks awfully good, and they just eat it, even because their, Christ, their fellow Christian is eating it. Or maybe they withdraw from the whole body of Christ and thus fall back into the world because of what's going on. Um, but Paul does not want them uh, to act in that way, even though uh, everything is indeed clean. It's wrong for anyone to make another stumble uh, by what he eats. Um, and Paul applies this, um, this principle that he just gave in verse uh, 20. He applies the principle beyond just the immediate matter of food uh, and applies it um, really to everything. And he says it applies to food, uh, it applies to wine, and it applies to anything that might cause uh, a Christian brother to stumble. And notice as he continues to address the strong here, uh, he does not tell the strong that in light of this current situation, in light of their context, he doesn't tell the strong that what they should do 
is just jump ship and join the weak camp. He's, it may sound like he's telling them to do that in everything we've been reading so far, but he's not actually telling them to do that. He says that their advanced understanding, their advanced faith um, is good, but in this situation, they need to keep that advanced understanding between themselves and God. Uh, they need to, to keep it between themselves and God. And Paul gives a little beatitude here, kind of like Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he pronounces a blessing on, on the strong. He says, the person who knows that they have no reason to pass judgment on themselves is blessed. Uh, the person who knows they don't need to condemn themselves for what they're doing, that's good. Um, but again, uh, in this context, they need to keep that faith between themselves uh, and God. Now, this is another verse where if we just had this sentence, the first part of verse 22, and no context around it, um, it could be taken to mean that the stronger Christians should just always keep their mouths shut, uh, that the stronger Christians should just always uh, choose to never mention their views uh, to other Christians, but ever, you know, just always just keep quiet. Um, but in context, I don't think that's what Paul is actually saying for a couple of reasons. One, Paul himself doesn't do this. Uh, Paul, as he's been writing, has revealed his opinion on these things. So he has not kept uh, his opinion to himself. Uh, and remember, Christians, both strong and weak, would be reading this letter. So, so Paul has revealed his own opinion. Um, but also, just thinking about it practically, Paul would love the weak Christians to grow. And if the strong just always keep their mouths shut, how are the weak ever going uh, to grow and become strong? So in the context of everything that Paul is saying, I think Paul is telling the strong Christians to be sensitive to the needs of the moment and uh, not brag, not flaunt their freedoms uh, in a way that could tempt another Christian uh, to sin and wait for the right time to have uh, fruitful, upbuilding conversations about these kinds of things, not conversations that would tear down the church, destroy the ones that Christ died for and lead others um, into sin. And verse 23, I think, seems to, it seems to support that interpretation because Paul moves right, in, right from what he says in verse 23. He moves right into talking about the one who eats um, not, not from a place uh, of confidence but from a place of doubt, which means that person is sinning. And that is what Paul is trying to uh, avoid. So, if the strong will keep their faith between themselves and God, then they can prevent um, verse 23 from happening. They can prevent some, or they can do their part in preventing someone from falling into sin. All right, uh, any questions or comments on verses 20 through 23? Um, how are we doing on time? We can move into chapter 15 a little bit, um, but any questions or, or comments on anything here? Barry. thinking here that uh, same thing you were saying really he's not asking the strong to change any of their standards or anything that they believe in he just asking them to show love to the yeah. weaker one that's the only thing different he's asking them to do yeah yeah you're right and and it's important to remember that guiding principle from i think it was verse 17 earlier um remember what the kingdom of god is all about righteousness peace joy in the holy spirit we or if we orient our lives towards those things then um, when we find ourselves in that stronger camp, how we should act will become clear. Um, and if we're in the weaker camp, for that matter, how we should act should become clear as well. Bob? Yes, as OB was reading that scripture, I, uh, the stumbling stood out of my mind, the stumbling block. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be very careful not to be a stumbling block, not to be someone that's always in the way or someone that uh, is a hindrance yeah. to the church or even a hindrance at home. So we have to be very careful about that. I know the bell is wrong, so that's all I have to say right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's a great point. We, we should strive not to live in such a way that we um, inhibit the growth of fellow Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kelsey. Um, I know probably a lot of us, when we read verse 23, you're suddenly like, oh, my goodness. But so I'm, I'm sinning every time I doubt something and do something, and I think that's not at all what he is saying here. I think that, I think that we're all going to have doubts about things. We're all going to have questions about things. But I think the point is, is you can have growth in your doubt. You know, I mean, yeah. if you have a doubt, 
study. If you have a doubt, talk to someone. If you have a doubt, pray about it. Like, I think that it's natural to doubt things and to question things. And I mean, there's all kinds of things that sometimes you read a scripture and you're like, this, uh, this is really confusing. It doesn't really make sense to me. Oh, no, I'm sinning now because I'm, I might yeah. do accidentally do something and condemn myself. And I think that, that sometimes that's, that's a fearful kind of a faith that yeah. we, we can grow from. So, so I know that I used to read scriptures like this and be like so fearful that I was just going to jump into sin at any moment at any time because I didn't understand something. But, but yeah. um, I, I, I think the point is, is, is there's like an intention. There's an intentionality about, about our actions. And yeah. I think purposefully doing something that you know is a sin in your mind is different yeah. from questioning and wondering and, and needing to grow and 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 the whole point of of that is that, you know look at the we're watching the chosen look at the disciples like they they were such babies in their faith and had so much to learn and stumbled and doubted and questioned and and he didn't just be like well I'm sorry you're you're out now you're condemned he gave them chance after chance and I think he does the same for us and it's just a matter of of admitting our our doubts and our and and admitting our weakness and needing to to needing help, needing yeah. God's help, needing each other's help. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that out because verse 23 is yet another verse. I mean, context is so important. If we only had <laughs> verse 23, um, we might take this to mean, all right, uh, I'm not entire. I'm, I'm pretty sure about something, but I have a little bit of hesitancy, a little bit of uncertainty, so I better, you know, just uh, never do anything if I have that feeling a little bit or else I might sin. Um, but remember the context here. What he means by doubt, he's referring to the weak camp who are quite sure that they should not eat certain foods. They are quite sure that they should continue to honor the Jewish religious calendar. Um, and so doubt here in this context doesn't mean living with confidence, but recognizing like on some things we have a little bit of uncertainty, but I'm moving forward in faith. That is not what Paul is saying in verse 23. He's saying whoever um, is, is quite convinced that a certain action is wrong, and they do it anyway, um, they are not pleasing God. So doubt here does not mean a little bit of uncertainty. In, in the context of this whole chapter, doubt here means uh, a conviction that something would be wrong. Yeah. It can't work the other way, too. Like Go ahead. If you, if you feel like you're strong in your faith, then you don't have to do that. Yeah. It can't work that way as well, though. So like... If, so if you're strong in your faith, and you don't, and you don't, if you think it's okay, it doesn't matter what you eat. Right. Yeah. Well, if you think it's okay and doesn't matter what you eat, um, I think based on what what Paul is saying, if it's okay to eat anything, then then surely it's not wrong to choose not to eat something, uh, if if that choice is being motivated by love. And, and I think that is what Paul is appealing to the strong to do here: is let mo- let love motivate them to choose not to engage in something uh, for the sake of the whole church. Yeah, so, so freedom, maybe this is important to remember, freedom is not always uh, the freedom to act. It also is sometimes the freedom to choose not to act in a certain context. Yeah. All right, well, that was the second bell, so we better be dismissed. We'll get into chapter 15 next week. Thank you all.